Welcome back to another episode of Lessons with Laura. I am absolutely thrilled and filled with so much gratitude to have my esteemed guest here today. And this is Osage Tribal Elder, Miss Margaret Bird. And Miss Bird has created an amazing collection of Native American Indigenous peoples ceremonial dress and regalia yes is that correct yes and we wanted to take a moment and mention that both miss bird and i have been vaccinated it's very important that we are gathering in a safe manner uh, because it has affected so many of the indigenous people and Miss Bird, we are conducting <clears throat> this interview at the Little House on the Prairie site, and this was Osage land that, yes. that we have returned to. Yes. And it uh, was a the diminished reserve at one time that the Osage were living yes. on. And um, I just wanted to ask you in terms of your collection you had mentioned that you were a very young girl when you had gone to a powwow mm -hmm. ceremony and how did that affect you well my mother it, you got to understand we have traditional dances and we have powwow mm -hmm. And we all like powwow. I call it bling bling because <laughs> back in the 1800s they didn't have a lot of rhinestones, a lot of fancy, you know, beads and stuff. And uh, it used to be, my mother told me that if you went to a dance, you could look at their feet, their moccasins, and tell what tribe they were. But nowadays we buy. Cheyenne moccasins, fully beaded moccasins, we buy different tribes that looks nice to us. And I said, I would like to make, and I was young, I've always sewn all my life. I never remember not having a needle and thread, you can tell by my hands. <laughs> have the same uh, hands. <laughs> but uh, I've always wanted to know what traditional dancers their Indian clothes was. And you got to remember that they did not have the modern materials and stuff that we have now, you know. And it's hard to find uh, broadcloth, you know. Uh, we used to get broadcloth from Germany and the factory burned. And remember, we had many years where we didn't have good broadcloth. And now we've got uh, people that makes it, different Indian stores, like uh, uh, Supernaws made it for several years, a man in Texas made it. But to, to make these clothes traditional, you have to go, you just don't get it out of a book because I have found that a lot of the books don't tell the story. Mm -hmm. So you go to the tribal, chief or elder or somebody from this tribe and you uh, ask them, tell them what you're wanting to do and they always ask, what are you going to do with this collection? Well, I've been asked many times, we'll start with three, that wants to buy my collection which is only 50 sets working on, which is a lot of Indian clothes. But you've got to remember, federally recognized, there's 300 and maybe 60, 70 now. Wow. And so this may go on forever. And there's no museum in the whole world, overseas or any place, that has all traditional Indian clothes that was made back when on contact. There, I, I feel very strongly that your work is so important and we should showcase and represent the Native Americans um, for how you began um, sewing. Was it your grandmother and mother that taught My you? My mother, when I was probably three, I ran a needle 
in my finger because I was on the sewing machine. <laughs> oh, I've done that. <laughs> it's painful. My oh. mother was so scared that she took me to the hospital with it. She took the needle out. She wouldn't pull it. I've always sewed and my aunt, my mother said I was born in Indian camp in Pahuska and on my birth certificate it says Indian village. Mm -hmm. And mother said my aunt was elderly and she would go out, she'd take her sewing, little sewing kit and a chair like this and sit outside because it was light and she could see and she'd put me on a blanket there and she said she'd look out the window keeping track of the elderly, you know, and the baby. And that lady would rub moccasins or hides all over me, you know, and on my hands. Mother said, your aunt marked you. And I guess that's why I've always been able to work with hides and things like that, and beads. And, uh, I've only done a, a bit of leather work and you know to really push that needle through yeah. your hands start to ache almost within <laughs> 30 minutes it's very yes <laughs> yes and uh, the the clothing that you're creating do is most of it by hand or is some of it on a machine well or the shirts and stuff like that but the bead work and the leather work's all done by hand and uh, it's, it's just, uh, there's uh, Indians and there's uh, mountain men or hobbyists mm -hmm. that you yes. can buy brain tan from. And now we're being able to get our brain tan hides from Germany, which it's like sewing through velvet, mm -hmm. if you know. Yes. Uh, but there's, there's secrets you learn all over the years how to sew with uh, commercial buckskin hides, you can take and run a, a empty thread through your machine and make your holes. Yes. And yes. also, there's needles now that you can get as real small, like when you make buckskin dresses and mm -hmm. stuff, where it'll go right through commercial hides. Mm -hmm. You just have to know the secrets. And, uh, hang around the rendezvous people and the Indian people and the hobbyists and mm -hmm. people from I've met from I've met gypsies from overseas that they do fantastic Indian work. Mm -hmm. It puts us to shame, you know. But you just keep studying uh, museums and and buy the books. Every time we do a show. We, like if we went, went on the riverboat, we went to Hannibal or something, I buy a book from that area, and I said that's on my bucket list to read when I'm old, and I'm old, and I'm still sewing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, you always try to do as much research from the person itself, and I always like to get an elder, and I've got a lot of Indian names from a lot of different tribes that I've stayed with, you know, to find out not powwow clothes, traditional clothes. Traditional clothes. Yeah. Now, when, how do you decide once you have completed, as, as you were mentioning, for for one set of clothing for a tribe? How do you select the next one? Is it that you have perhaps attended an event and are inspired? Well, it started out when I was young, a young woman. My children used to dance at powwows in Alaska, and the youngest one especially, uh, David Bird, who lives just a mile from here closely, uh, he had long hair. And the children, Oklahoma, there were several Indian children in Oklahoma that got kicked out of school because of the long hair issue. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I got involved in the American Indian movement, and I'm still <coughs> an AIM. Mm -hmm. And that got me around many tribes and uh, traveling around, and uh, it just depended on where I went. Mm -hmm. You know, and people just come and stay with me, and that's how I got acquainted and mm -hmm. started when I was a young woman. You know, I did a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and of course they name me and I've tried to write down the names of Sue. The, in naming ceremonies? Yes, yeah, they just say, well, we're just going to take you as our daughter. And mm -hmm. Even up in Canada, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. I went and taught uh, all three Delaware tribes, Moccasin, Macon, but the people in Canada had borrowed from another tribe their clothes because they did not know how the Delawares dressed. Well, I have an aunt, two aunts that were Delaware, and I was raised around the Lenape people. And they are all beautiful seamstresses, ribbon work and bead work and everything. So I come from two worlds. I'm not Lenape blood, but I know probably more Lenape than I do Osage because I live in that little yes. area. And uh, we just got to work, you know, on that and started, you know, with it. Well, I imagine, too, that it helps to have a visual representation of your identity. And there's layers of meaning, I'm mm -hmm. sure, it, you know, when you're stitching. Um, I try to always stitch with love. Yeah. And I'm sure that you're creating. I don't know area. about Catherine is a, she's a ribbon worker, mm -hmm. you know, but whenever we have death or sick or really sadness in our family, I just stop because I've been told that when you're sewing and doing all of this, you're putting your sorrows and yes. sadness in this. You're like weaving it in. Yeah. Yes. I so I just too. stop, put it away and pray about it and think and then I have a feeling to go back to it, mm -hmm. but I've got so many projects right now, <laughs> you can't hardly walk in my living room. <laughs> I think any good seamstress, yeah. absolutely. Uh, you know, I might be waiting for um, special beading for a dress or certain buttons, mm -hmm. and um, sometimes just hunting uh -huh. one item um, I was looking for and what they refer to them as blackberry buttons and they were very popular in the 1880s. It took me three years of, to finally find yeah. blackberry buttons and so I imagine when you're considering um, a tribal piece of clothing you very much want to honor that tribe. Um, so. I'm sure you get asked this question. Um, people often, when they see what I'm making, um, they'll say, now how long did that take you to make? <laughs> and it's like, well, let's see, research was two years, and then sourcing all the materials. How long does one garment um, take A you? long time. I've had, I went, to different tribes and had friends and all of them, the reason I have done their clothes. There's only been one tribe that did not want me to show the clothes because they knew I did Indian fashion shows and that was the loyal Shawnees. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they made me a set of clothes that I've got in storage that I have never showed those clothes. Mm -hmm. But the Queen Bee and uh, a couple of friends of Loyal Shawnees, they dressed in clothes. So I'm at a dilemma. What am I going to do with this set they asked me never to show? Yes. Because there's so many different, back east especially. It used to be Indians wasn't popular. Mm -hmm. yes. And then it got everything, we're all popular. Every Indian's really popular, and I always thought they were, every one of them. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I don't know what to do about that other than tell that story and who told it someday if I ever do get a museum. I don't know if that'll ever happen. I was young and I could travel around, but nowadays I'm elderly and I would like to find college kids that was interested in this, Indians, to, uh, pass down the to keep it going because it'll take many years. Uh, 
to get this collection done mm -hmm. because we keep getting more tribes every year mm -hmm. federally recognized. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these tribes I've talked to didn't even know how their clothes was. Like when I was in Canada, they I went up there many years uh, and I had a class in uh, the Delawares up there and they had it in the gymnasium, tables set up, and I was just shocked that little children come and of course you gotta figure out how what to do with these little kids. So you gotta get them to doing some sort of lead work or something like that to occupy them. And the next year, uh, Nick Clark, who was over at the museum in Muncie, invited me up to go up there. They wanted me to come back to Canada. And I was so surprised that I had a friend, uh, she's still my friend, and we still visit quite frequently, Sandy Snake, that she went on. You can always tell when you do a class who's going to keep it going and who's just doing it for pastime. And Sandy picked right up on the ribbon work and the leather work and what have you. And when they had their powwow, I was so shocked to see all these Delawares dressed in their clothes and not the neighbor's clothes. Mm -hmm. So that really made me feel good. Very and, powerful. I'm yeah, sure that was a powerful and, uh, moment. I, uh, I was really touched to see that it went on and Richard Snake, he was the chief up there for 39 years and he came to the Delaware Pow Wow in Dewey or Copan and he always stayed at my house, the family did, and he said, we're just going to keep you up here in Canada, one of my trips, and we're just going to steal you and keep you. <laughs> and, uh, he passed, but his wife and family still living up there, and I talk to him about once a month, you know. But that's how you get to know. Uh, you can't put a price on any of these clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, went to one dance, me and my cousin. We thought we'd get away from the powwow people, and we went up to... Uh, uh, Oneida, Wisconsin, for a weekend. We drove, she drove most of the way, Catherine Lookout, and there was all our people that was at the powwows up there, and they dressed me and Catherine in Indian clothes, so there was a set of clothes that was given to me, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I've had two or three that was given that uh, they just liked me and well, it's a tremendous honor, I'm yeah. sure. And Silver Smith, I had a friend who was a, a Delaware man, and uh, we had a, uh, Ben Stone was a hobbyist, I would say, because he did fantastic silver work. And I talked Ben into teaching an Indian man or anybody to do our silver because so many of the clothes has lots of silver. Mm -hmm. And that's real expensive mm -hmm. to buy the silver. On the Delaware, it's just coated with little washer brooches just all over the Mother uh, Hubbard, I call it. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. blouse. And uh, anyway, I paid for uh, Don because he had a job in Wichita, Don Second Dine. I paid his salary to get him to come for a week to learn silversmith from this, I call it a master silversmith. Mm -hmm. And he just went and stayed with him and, and uh, Ben's deceased and he said out of all of his students that tried to learn silver work, uh, he was a natural. So that's how you get it. Yeah. Do you find that the younger generation is not as interested in learning the old techniques? Or has there been a resurgence of younger people? I, I go if I teach a class. I may have, the last class I taught was the Lenape down here, and it was moccasin making. 
and probably I had 46 students and probably five out of the bunch, you can just walk around and tell if they're interested. Mm -hmm. Of course, they all want their moccasins made because they run about $500. There's ribbon work and bead work on them. And uh, they, of course, they wanted to do them, but it, you could just tell the ones that was interested and they're going to keep mm -hmm. passing it on to you. Yeah. Yes. These few will tell you and whoever, you know, that's how it works. So you brought two special guests with you today, and I imagine that in some of how you arrange your garments, the clothing, does it tell a story in some of the yeah. big work? Yeah. And so you brought um, Miss McCauley and Miss um, Redcorn, so I would like to stop for a minute and bring them over to introduce okay. them and we'll speak with them okay. as well. Okay. So. Welcome back to Lessons with Laura. Today I am very excited. I have two very special guests. These are tribal elders from the Osage Nation and we have Miss McCauley. She is a storyteller and Miss Redcorn was director for many years of the museum. And you ladies, did you learn the art of storytelling from family members or how did you become involved? I just love to read. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the times whenever I read, I, I wanted to share what I read. Mm -hmm. and. Um, it, and it didn't have to be long, it could be short. A lot of times I would call Margaret and just over the phone would read it to her because I, I would just get so excited about it and it just kind of evolved in that. But uh, a lot of the times I just helped Margaret with her fashion show. Yes, so are you, uh, when you and Margaret come together to do a fashion show, um, are you narrating it through storytelling? No, she, or? she narrates and I just help her um, dress the people and, mm -hmm. and keep a list on who's coming out, <laughs> you know. I am really excited that I, the next time you have a fashion show, I would really love to attend and see some of your work. Beautiful. And bring in awareness. Um, Miss Bird was talking about that there's a need for a museum that showcases this amazing collection. And I would like to spread the word that it could possibly happen. And, and I'm sort of looking over at Miss Showdorf, who is who's off camera, um, as I mentioned. Okay, okay. <laughs> As I mentioned um, in the previous video, we are currently at the Little House on the Prairie Museum site in Independence, Kansas, and this is was once um, Osage land that your families lived on. And now for the museum, did you were you originally one of the individuals that helped to create? The museum in Oklahoma. Can you no, tell me about that? Uh, I uh, I went there uh, kind of by accident. <laughs> I was retired, <laughs> and and, uh, and the tribal council called me and asked me if uh, I would come and help them out and, and get the collection kind of straightened yes. out and everything. And I said no. <laughs> well, you're retired. <laughs> I'm retired, <laughs> but. Uh, Anyway, uh, so I ended up, I said, well, I guess I could help you a little bit. And, and so I went up there, and I stayed 17 years. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, and that's a heck of a time card. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I got so interested in everything in there. And, of course, the collection dates back to uh, the John L. Burke collection, which he started collecting in the late 1800s. And the Tribal Council purchased that collection from him okay. in 1938. 1938, mm -hmm. wow. And then when the museum opened, 
And when it opened, I used to go up there as a child and go up there and look at all those things and just think, oh, it's so neat to see all these old items. And, and, uh, and at that time, the museum was just that front room uh, was the only, and the rest of it was an auditorium. So, um, well, I, I, I think um, some viewers may not be aware that your museum is actually the oldest museum in the United States mm -hmm. that showcases um, artifacts and different... Um, it's the and oldest tribally owned museum. Oldest tribally owned, <clears throat> thank mm -hmm. you. And, yes. uh, uh, and then they started out with the John Elberg collection. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it has just built from mm -hmm. there. It has expanded mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. the years. I have not been to the museum yet. It is on my bucket list. I hope to do it within the next month or two and to really um, share the amazing collections um, to cast, you know, make more awareness. Um, so many people are not aware of the wonderful contributions that have been made and the lovely handcrafts and the amazing tools and we don't want that to be lost that mm -hmm. as is as i'm sure you know you, it's your goal for your next generation to make sure that it continues mm -hmm. and so you as a storyteller um, do you um, ever work with children or speak to groups or is that just within a small circle? Right now it's within a small circle. Uh, it's, uh, I would love to have a lot of Indian stories for the small children because you would have to keep them mm -hmm. separate. Yes. The stories, you know. Yes. And so these um, stories that you tell um, have they been handed down from the generations, or? Uh, a lot of them, I, it's a uh, written word. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I just love to read. Yes, <laughs> yes. Have you always, from, from the time you were a small child, you yeah, had a lot of reading? Yeah, it's a lot of ways to travel. <laughs> it it you really know, is, because it expands, it expands your, your mind, it expands your horizons. And I think for many, I really always encourage children to read because you can create a world in your mind and learning about things. I, uh, I'm kind of a research nerd that I love to learn new things um, all the time. And uh, my daughter and I, when she was very small, we moved to the island of Crete in Greece. Mm -hmm and learning about different cultures and food. And when we moved there, um, we did not speak Greek, we, and it's of course a different alphabet. And so we had to go through and learn that, and that was such an invaluable experience. It really um, made us, um, you know, it opened up a whole new world, and it gives you a greater appreciation. And Mrs. Bird, I was somewhat Miss Bird, I was somewhat smiling. Um, you were talking about the German leather. So after that, we moved to Germany for three years. And their <laughs> leather, you know, that they often make uh, for their cultural attire of the later hosen, is just the, the most buttery soft. It's it's beautiful for for working and. Were there exhibits at the museum that you were particularly proud of during your time there? Well, we have what we call the Osage 10, <clears throat> which was a, a collection of um, busts that were done at the opening of the Panama Canal. Oh. And they, and they unveiled those busts in San Diego mm -hmm. many years ago. And then they went into storage at the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. and no one ever saw them. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. But a, a lady who was Osage, her grandfather, they did a bust of him. And uh, her name was Evelyn Trumbly. And she called me one day, and she said, uh, I have this bust that I've got at the Smithsonian. 
And she said, so she told me the story of it, and she said they had done 10 Osage busts. And she said, mm -hmm. so she said she and her mother were started out there when she was just a teenager. And they got in a real bad car wreck in Kentucky mm -hmm. and was in the hospital for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And she said, so of course that ended their trip to turn around and come home. And she said, years later, she, and I think this was probably about 10, 15 years ago, she said, uh, she was telling her husband about it. And he said, well, why don't we go out there and look at it? So they went out there and they met with them. Oh <clears throat> and of course they had to find them, the Smithsonian yes. did, because, you know, the yes. you know, story was so yes. long. And um, so they said, so she was going out there and they made her a copy of it, of the oh. bust in plaster. And it looked like the real deal, you know. And uh, so she called me and she said, Catherine, she said, I'd hate to take this home because the only one will see it, the only ones will see it is my family. And uh, she said, I'm going to give it to you for the museum. And so I had a reception and invited a lot of people and they oh come up. Goodness. And we unveiled it there at the, at oh, the wow. museum. And uh, so uh, the Smithsonian people come out to meet with us when we did that. And, and I said, well, how many of those do you have? And they said, well, we have 10 Osages. And so we sat down and negotiated a price for them. And I said, uh, he said, well, how many do you want? I said, I want all of them. I said, I can't take them today, yes. but I'll raise the money and go get them. So what we did, we, we drew, we, we put all their names in a, in a yes. bucket and drew one out. And my daughter and I paid for the first one. So we, so we could show that it was affordable, people mm -hmm. could do it. And then it just took off from there. Oh. It took about three years to get all 10 of them. So it's really a community collection. Right. Uh -huh. And uh, and there's only one woman in the uh, group. So were these um, busts made of tribal leaders? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. And uh, Chief Fred Lookout, I think there's three chiefs in mm -hmm. there. And uh, uh, the first one that we drew from, from was his name was uh, Little Wing. Mm -hmm. I swear that bust his arms were this big. <laughs> I thought I put a name for him, <laughs> but uh, but it's a so they're all on an mm -hmm. exhibit at the museum now, and then the other project that uh, I've worked on, there were so many photographs there. I swear it was it just must have had the photograph made every time they went to town because we had a lot of duplicates and things like that. So I was trying to figure out what to do with them. We were separating them and. And so we decided to do an Alati mm -hmm. exhibit of photographs. So we started with the very first Alati and his wife and their children. And those were the first, second, third, and fourth of the exhibit. Mm -hmm. And then we just went from there and then just added to it. And then the tribe got involved. Mm -hmm. And then people wanted their families to be in the, the collection. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's when I set my goal. When uh, I get 1,500 of these done, I'm going to retire. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, you know, you, you bring up a, a, a very important point that if we come together as a community, mm -hmm. wonderful things can right. happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm absolutely down in the description box. I'm going to link to the museum website so you can further your research um, to support efforts such as what has been started because it, we do need to preserve this for the next generation. This is in very, very important work that is being done. Um, as a seamstress, what Miss Bird is doing, it, it speaks to my heart because it's a true labor of love um, to whenever I'm creating something and you know people will say, oh, can you make me that dress? I like to giggle and say, you couldn't afford it. <laughs> because, you know, the, this most recent dress that I finished, the, 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 just the stitching was probably 50 hours, if not more. And so to encourage people to 
really preserve this this special work is is so important and I'm so thankful that you ladies have come and talked to us today and I would like to consider this as just the beginning. Um, our family would like to help you um, realize some of these dreams and the, the best way I think to do this is by talking about it and getting the word out. And um, Mrs. Uh, Miss Bird, if you wouldn't mind coming back over here and, and joining us. Um, these wonderful ladies are just a true treasure and I thank each and every one of you for just coming here today and, and spending time with us because you um, are doing something that is such of great value. Um, our world is a better place because of what you are doing and I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you.